Greetings, friends, and thank you for joining us today. On today's show, joining me is Neethi, the pharmacist, and you're also a food aggregator as well. Is, that's correct, right? Correct, correct. So, how, Neethi, thank you for joining us first off. We, uh, my family and I really enjoyed hanging out with you, what was that, two years ago now at Polyface Farm for the uh, one of the Wise Traditions conferences that was there, and we just had a blast at that event, and it was nice getting to know you there. Uh, and it's just nice to be able to talk with you again. I know you've been talking with Lacey uh, throughout the year and uh, last year in, in various settings. <laughs> it's nice to sit down here and chat with you today. And and uh, we're going to chat about a number of things. First, of all, I want to ask, how in the world did you get the name or how did you name yourself the pharmacist? Not the pharmacist <laughs> with P-H, but with F-A-R-M. Farm wow. in the pharmacist. <laughs> First, I just wanted to thank you so much for having me on today. I appreciate that. And um, yes, I like, I can't even believe it's only, it's been two whole years since we saw each other. That's crazy. (laughs) But um, yes, I I became Neethi the pharmacist because I, I kind of didn't plan this whole thing. <laughs> um, you know, I kind of just fell into this role. Um, so we had a daughter who had been battling cancer and we were, you know, doing like loads of research and, you know, like any parent, we were ready to move to the ends of the earth to do anything that we had to do for our child. And in that process, I was just receiving this massive education, um, about how to use food as medicine and as a side effect. Um, you know, people started coming to me, like just people in the community. I wouldn't even know how people found me. Now people all around the globe, like it's, it's kind of amazing. People just have been coming to me and, um, it was interesting because everything I was using for their medicine was from the farms and, um, it might've been that they received a diagnosis from a physician or a chiropractor or whomever, like however they received it. And then they would come to me with that. And so I was, I'm not like, I don't actually diagnose people actually, but when they have a diagnosis, then I was able to help them remediate it um, and move back towards health just using food and, or, you know, maybe herbs or maybe tinctures or something, but it was always off the farm. And so one time there was a woman and she said, you know, you have been the best pharmacist I've ever had. And I just thought, what? And she said, you really, you know, and my husband started laughing. He goes, yeah, from the F-A-R-M. And, <laughs> um, and so I became Neethi the pharmacist. I don't wow, know. That's, <laughs> that's neat. That is neat. <laughs> so it, it, explain a little bit more for those of you who don't know your story about what you were going through with your daughter because you didn't grow up into farming or anything like that did you no No. i I didn't either but going through that traumatic time period in your life led you to making these changes and and see how important food is so can you explain a little bit more about that i know that was a tough time that you went through but it uh it was for a reason Oh yeah. I mean, I will tell you, we were polished, weren't we? Like, I think none of us have arrived here lightly. Um, uh, I'll say that. So my grandfather was a renowned homeopathic physician and I come from a family of doctors, which include allopathic surgeons too. So, you know, we have a lot of physicians in the family. Um, But my grandfather was the person who, who all of the other Uh, allopathic physicians even would refer to for internal medicine. Hmm. Um, And so our, our family has always practiced more or viewed health in a holistic way. So I never would believe or know um, that, you know, I I just know that you were never out of balance unless it has something to do with your lifestyle. So it's always lifestyle. It's never otherwise. And, um, so when my daughter was diagnosed with this cancer that just knocked us off our feet, like we couldn't even believe we were very, um, shocked (laughs) 
and confused and you know everything i read i write about it in detail in my book if you anybody who really wants to know uh the details in uh thank you mike <laughs> yeah anyone who wants to know the details in context if you read the book it'll it'll give you that context but i just always knew it had something to do with that you know it never so i had decided that i was just going to research food and environment when we were in the hospital because you know one of the first things i said to the doctors was like okay well so you don't have a cure for cancer obviously otherwise everybody would know that you had a cure and so because you don't have a cure then okay let's talk about it you know and it was really interesting mike they did not appreciate our interest mm. in partnering with them wow so that was yeah. kind of a trip yeah not totally surprising once you kind of know more about the system <laughs> yeah it's really sad i yeah. i don't know i mean at that time it was very frustrating they were calling us out they were they actually had specific meetings with me just to reprimand me for advocating for my daughter which wow. that was crazy wow and our society puts them so high up on on these pedestals and uh, and, and one of the things that you mentioned in your book that uh, was really neat, interesting, uh, you talked about the chemotherapy and equating it to the human torture and even uh, linking it back to uh, some of the torture things they used to do back in the day. It seemed same similar concept as far as their their mindset of when they used to drill holes in people's heads thinking they were getting the demons out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty crazy. How was I mean, it going through that, seeing your daughter go through that and learning through that? say again how was it going through that and and having to learn through that about that time period that she was getting the chemo and all that mm. it was so hard because okay first of all no one wants to watch their child suffer no. i mean most of us can't handle just watching them having to cope with a fever never mind anything else or you know like a, a fall you know anytime they get scraped up or something um and so, I mean, that was really tough. It was, it was tough. It was frustrating. It was, it was mostly upsetting, I think, just because um, they weren't willing to have conversations with me. Like, you know, they did not want to partner with me, like I said. Yeah. And, and so that was, that was really tough. We actually had created our own board if you will, like our own, uh, because we have a family of physicians. So between our family and other people around the world, you know, um, a lot of folks that were specialists that were friends of the family, um, we were having regular, regular meetings and, and discussing her case and the hospital couldn't really do anything about it because they don't have a cure. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, and we were working with other medical professionals. We weren't just, you know, trying to, I mean, so they couldn't really say too much to us. I would say that, um, yeah, it was it was extremely tough, and I think that, um, I'm sorry, I got lost in the emotion of that. And no, I'm, I'm so sorry. I know this is a tough thing, and it was a tough thing, and and how has helped shape who you are. And now that you're able to help people, one of the things that I that I really thought was really really interesting is as the changes you were making, you were deciding that what was happening in the hospital, what they were doing was not benefiting your daughter and, and how you started making changes um, to her, her diet and the things that you were doing. And you started seeing completely different. Would, would you, are you come, okay going over that with some people? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I'll, I'm like snapping out of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. It was very, very frustrating that, what they were doing didn't look like healing. Mm -hmm. I think that you guys have been in the hospital with your family members before. There are other people out there who have also. And I don't think that there's anything in the hospital that looks like healing. No, no. Every time I've been there, it never looks like healing. And every time that we've tried to do something at home, it always looks and feels like healing. Yeah. And so what I what I have learned out of this whole thing is that you know, number one, you can't heal unless you're at home. And, you know, like people make fun of the old timers, the men, the old timey men who wouldn't never, they would refuse to go to the hospital and they would just be like, I'm gonna have to die 
if I have to go there or something. And so they wouldn't go, but they were right. Like you had to stay home. I mean, you really are better off in a lean to outside than you are in a hospital or even at home. Yeah. If you can't do anything else, because being able to ground an earth actually is more healing. Yeah. And so what we were witnessing there, I mean, I called it human torture therapy because it was, it was definitely torture for my child, but we were allowing it. Yeah. And that is what I had to come out with and live with and reconcile. And, you know, Mike, until I actually took responsibility for that, a lot of people don't like when I say this, but I 100% take responsibility for participating in, you know, the medical murder of my daughter because I allowed them to do that because I was convinced by the orthodoxy that I don't know enough to be able to help my child or to be responsible for her. And I had given that up from before she was born because I was trying so hard to be a good mom, you know, because they tell you that you have to have a pediatric physician or whoever in place. And, you know, like we're never allowed to really um, be responsible for their health. And if I would have been, I would have been more careful about what I was feeding them, the kids and, and all of that. And, and honestly, I was cooking from scratch and I knew food mattered, you know, and because of my background with our family, you know, uh, all the physicians and stuff, but I was, I was sucked into a lot of convenient stuff, like a lot of people, um, because, I mean, the USDA and I don't know, the FDA and everybody said, you know, like, I mean, if, if it's if it's out there, it's safe. I mean, I, I'll tell you what, Mike, I don't like the word safety or safe anymore. I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> I am right there with you. <laughs> I even have issues when, when someone's traveling back somewhere of not saying have safe travel anymore, just because I have so much of an issue with the word now. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's kind of a trigger word for me. Honestly, yeah. it's that uh, safe. Yeah. What do you mean safe? I'm always <laughs> safe. I don't need no safety. Let's be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> It's okay. We're going to be dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know if I answered your question with that. but <laughs> yeah. So let's just, let's fast forward a little bit past that. You, you learn, you got through that. Uh, you started making the changes. Your daughter was improving, but it was, I guess you were at the point where it just, uh, uh, it wasn't enough. It was, I guess maybe too late or, or whatever, but um, you, you Wait, I, I, I'll, I'll clarify something for my daughter's okay. situation. She was terminal upon presentation. I want everybody to know that. Okay. Why? Why was she terminal? She was terminal because her entire sphenoid bone was gone. Oh, wow. The cancer had consumed it. There was no coming back from that. Wow. There was no coming back from that for her because even if we got rid of the cancer, which we did, we killed the cancer. I want everybody to know that too. But there was no coming back for her because upon presentation, her entire sphenoid bone was gone, which means her basic structure that holds the brain, like the brain sits on top of this Dora that opens up, that becomes the sinus cavity. And mm. it is immersed in and around, it becomes the shell, I guess, for like a layman shell uh, term, <laughs> I'm going to say, where underneath that you have all the, all these blood vessels and you have your carotid artery and you have your thyroid and you have all these vital structures, you know, and you have the optical nerves and all these very, I mean, all the vital structures in your head sit right under the brain and a lot of blood flow is going on there. And it is because of all that blood flow that the cancer cells were ab able to grow so hard and so fast and proliferate. And, you know, those cells were so deranged and rapidly um, proliferating as a side effect of all of that blood that was feeding it. Um, and so in her case, she was not expected to live 24 hours. Wow. And we were able to extend her life for two solid years, which people don't understand what a big deal that is. Wow. Wow. It's a big deal because she was two 
and their metabolism is so hard and so fast that they're developing so rapidly. It's equivalent, like the amount of research that a medical hospital can get from a two-year-old is, you know, like in one year is equivalent to 10 years. Wow. Wow. And that is the reason why, which I don't know how many people know this, but that's the reason why when a two-year-old is diagnosed with cancer, they do not allow them to leave the hospital because every month is like a year of wow. research. And wow. they are literally using our children as pin cushions, which I am not okay with. Yeah. I mean, wow. they, they basically use our babies as lab rats. And that is what I told them. I said, my daughter is not your pincushion. Yeah. Wow. I, wow. I just really want people to know that that is exactly what's going on. And then adults who are cancer patients are able to leave the hospital, but children are never allowed to leave. Wow. Wow. So imagine how devastating it is for a child to never be able to be with their family, really, because they can never come out. That's just terrible. That's just terrible. <clears throat> so as you were, you were changing the diet, you, you brought your child home and you saw, you said you were able to, with the diet, kill, uh, kill the cancer, make improvements. You learned, what did you learn from that as you were watching that happen, as you were, you were changing the diets and implementing these things? Uh, what kind of testimony was it to you, even though you, you had the background of, of more of a natural way, but seeing it even more on a, on a, a more impactful scale to see how much diet is important? Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit? I, all I have to say about that is nature has grace. Nature has grace. I have, I could not believe how powerfully nature was able to remediate her health in days and weeks, you know, um, days. And I did not even know then what I know now, but like, what I was, all we did was stop eating everything out of a store or a restaurant and just started eating it off the farm. I mean, you know, now you know that I'm like extra like keto carnivore, but like at that time we just were like, if we can't get it from somebody who we know locally, I mean, now I can talk to you extensively about circadian rhythm and light and all these other things, but all of it really boils down to if you can't grow it outside your doors, like outside and you outside your, you know, hunting range, let's call it, you shouldn't eat it. Like anybody who's eating anything from California, it makes no sense because that food holds that light energy from wherever it was produced. And so that alone will disrupt your hormonal system just because it doesn't match your circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, I mean, the very, very basic, what, what I basically mean is when you step outside and you look at the sky with your naked eyes, then your body is in with infinite intelligence being programmed by the sunshine and even if the sun isn't touching you even if it's a cloudy day like just that exchange that's happening between your body and the environment in which you stand is is a is a is like a download of you know information for all the the infinite um you know, systems in the body that are communicating uh, with this infinite intelligence. You know, people have called it like the white light of Christ or, you know, there's all these different names for it. Um, but that is divine. And, and when you don't honor that, you know, by putting on sunglasses, by putting on sunscreen or sunblock, or, you know, by hiding, inside i mean we aren't meant to be living indoors like that you know yeah so yeah yeah so <clears throat> as you were after so let's just kind of can you explain a little bit of how you took that experience the things you were learning and then you started developing how did you start de developing the relationships with the farms and with others how they started coming to you for uh how to improve their health like, how did all that start happening? 
It was infinite intelligence and divine as well, Mike. I mean, I was not trying to do anything except for, you know, save my family. Yeah. And, you know, our daughter, what she basically did was save our lives because she really made us have to focus and deliberately and intentionally get rid of all of the garbage in our house. I mean, if you read, when you read my book, I say I threw away everything, like from underneath the kitchen sink, underneath the bathroom sink, you know, everything in my kitchen. When I tell you I threw it away, I threw it away. My husband was just like, um, I was very pregnant <laughs> and I just, you know, when they say nesting, you know, like I was just scrubbed out my house and I threw everything away. And then my husband was just like, what are we going to eat? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And, you know, it was so funny. My, um, my uh, editor was like, you have to tell everybody what y'all ate when you did that. And I said, I really think we didn't eat. I think we just <laughs> acted that night. And it was probably the best thing we ever did was just to not eat. We were just crying and really yeah. um, mourning um, and, you know, accepting this responsibility. And then I went out and I just tried to find the food. And, you know, like people are like, how do you find the food? And I was like, I don't, you know, what I did was I walked out and I just kept asking people at, at the farm. I live in the state capital. So we have the state farmer's market here. So it's supposed to be all of the best of the best or whatever of our state, you know. And I went down there and I started just talking to people. I mean, we were already, by the way, supporting them and getting food from there. But now I'm asking for where is the meat? Where is the other stuff? Like the stuff that I would not like that I would want to go to the store to go buy. I mean, obviously we don't have no Cheetos and Doritos there, but like, <laughs> like I was looking to see like, what, where can, how can I get the other things that I need? Yeah. And, and, you know, I found out we had a local grain mill. We had local people fishing. We had local people doing all of these amazing things. I mean, I'm like, but where are they? Cause they're not all at this market. Yeah. And so wow. like, how do I, how do I find them? And so I started talking and then what I realized is our state farmers market is only five of the major families that politically allow themselves to control this market. And then I started learning about how, how political all the farmers markets were and how difficult it was for makers and growers to participate. And then I thought to myself, like as an eater, uh, that's, that's uh, I, yuck. I don't yeah. like, like I should be able to get the highest quality. I should be able to like, there should be able to be 10 chicken producers there and I should be able to pick which one I want to support. Yeah, exactly right. And totally. you know, if somebody doesn't care about how this guy's doing it or that guy's doing it and, or that guy can is maybe more efficient and can afford to do it cheaper. And that's more important to somebody like whatever, whatever it is, everybody should be able to, um, you know, have this relationship and figure it out. And then I realized, you know, as I got to know a lot more producers and stuff, then there's this inconsistency. I went through um, my, I did my 10 years, you know, my 10 years of learning um, how, how, why people think farmers are not so intelligent. <laughs> and it's not, you know what it is, is it is not that, that farmers or homesteaders or anybody is not very intelligent. It is the system. Yeah. The centralized system. And this is something that I don't think homesteaders understand versus farmers versus whatever, like people don't understand the differences. And, um, and I have been able to see it from a, a bigger lens, like, I'm going to use Joel Soliton, who's my mentor, as an example for this. Like he has a global perspective and a global lens that he can see things through on top of his how many years? Like, you know, they just had their um, Diamond Jubilee, you know, um, on the farm. And so how about 60 years? OK, 60 years yeah. of experience. Um, between him and yeah, between him and his dad and his son, I mean, but whatever, like they've had this incredible, you know, I don't care what anybody says. You can't, you can't take away his experience. And so that lens, he's able to look at things through. Yeah. You know? Um, so I also have this unique lens, 
um, you know, of the past 12 years of working with all of these various people. And one of the things that I know for sure, for sure, and Joel will back me up on this one. So, cause I've checked it with him. I'm like, am I right? Cause I don't know, you know? And he's like, yes, but people don't get it. Like they don't understand. And for him to talk about some of these things might not, it might not sound so good because he is a farmer and I'm not. So for me, I am kind of, you know, not vested. I don't, I'm not biased in that way. Um, I can just speak for, you know, like, Hey guys, here's what's up. Okay. Um, homesteaders don't understand the risk that a farm is having to take like a full-time farm financially. What they risk is way greater as a homesteader you are able to decide how much you're producing um, that you're willing to barter or whatever. And it's just your extra. It's not really a risk. Mm -hmm. yep. And so it's not comparable to the person who is 100% only trying to manage their in, you know, income and everything for their family by taking and the risk of the responsibility of feeding all these people, the pressure. Yep. We, yeah. well, I've, I've done both. So I, I, I totally know what you mean as a farmer and a homesteader. It's uh, the pressure is a lot lighter as a homesteader, as far as having to provide for other people. <laughs> yes. When you take on the onus of being responsible and you have all these families that are relying on you for food, that's a lot of pressure. It sure is. It's a lot of pressure for me being being in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And, because and I'm feeling sorry. People have already, and especially people have already paid you up front if you're running like a CSA most of the time, and then you have that added pressure that, whoo, I got to make sure that I produce so that way they get what they've paid for. <laughs> well, and in our case, it's like I mean, I say in the food church, like we have a commitment to the eaters that our work is, you know, the producers are responsible for filling the larders here and the eaters are responsible for emptying them <laughs> and that is their only work <laughs> and um you know a lot of folks act like they think that i have something in it you know what they don't understand is eaters are 100 percent supporting the farmers here there's there's no wholesale going on yeah and it's 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 not possible for there to be wholesale what you guys don't know what no one out there knows because department of ag and all of the institutions are teaching you you know you can only you're only allowed to sell hulls halves and quarters if in case you don't know uh de facto this is not a real law this is a de facto law okay and so if you're trying to operate within the parameters of department of ag you are set up to fail 100 percent 100% gold fail. They don't want you to win because your food is so powerful. It is so medicinal that you can reverse cancer. You can re reverse diabetes. You can reverse, you know, MS. You can reverse every ailment. And no one should ever be able to do that because you should only have to use your insurance and go to the doctor. Like that is what that's what you're supposed to be believing. And, um, and I just happen to know for a fact that is a total lie. And I just want everybody to know that. And they don't like me because I want everybody to know that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's empowering in so many ways to be able to, to feed yourself good food. Yes. Yeah. But what you don't have to do it. You? I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just saying, you don't have to do it yourself. You were, you were asking me about, you know, what it's like to be able to connect the people or because I'm aggregating it. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, I was going to say that. I, I so admire you for that. You're you're you don't necessarily have your farm, but you have found a way to develop a connection between the farms and still be able to to get nutrient dense food and also to be able to to make uh, to be able to provide it to others to make that connection between the farm and then the eaters, as you call it. To, to provide them with uh, with good food. And I, I admire you for that, that most people think that they can't have that connection just because they don't have a property or farm or homestead or whatever, but you have found a way to make it happen. And that it's so neat. And um, 
and how did you how did you get into that? Because some people that may be a route that they could take. Maybe they can't go somewhere and get that property and grow the food this, themselves, but maybe they could do what you're doing. Yes. So you, I mean, anybody who wants to do it, by the way, like I have an affiliate program that now that I'm launching, I'm ready to do it and teach. You know, I was trying to figure out how I was going to teach it. Like, is it, is it repeatable? <clears throat> and once I started to write it all out, you know, we have these uh, 10 pillars of how the food church works. And, um, and it is my encouragement for people to do that. Like, you know, if you're interested, we would love to plant more food churches. People don't like that I call it a food church, but let me just say, the reason I do that is because, you know, if you're gonna play a game and say to me that we're not allowed, you know, the Department of Ag and the USDA and the NCDA and the FDA are on record stating that Americans do not have the right to choose what they eat. And what they mean is, you know, um, if because you don't take responsibility because they trained you to not to take responsibility because they made you a consumer. Mm -hmm. And so Mike was saying that I like to call them eaters. Well, what it is is that I'm teaching people, human beings, you have to be a human being first. And then because what they want you to be is a robotic consumer, mm -hmm. a dehumanized, like they don't like us talking to each other. They don't like it. Yeah. And when you start talking to each other, then we, our power starts to flow and there's more of us and there's fewer of them yeah. and yeah. that terrifies them. And so anyone out there who feels like you want to do something in this space and you're just like, I can't just go get land or I can't do, you don't have to, yeah. I didn't, I wasn't prepared. I couldn't do it because my husband wasn't going to do it. And like, you know, um, I had to figure out a way to do this. My husband's rules were, you know, like we have this life here and why would we do that? And, you know, now, of course, he's kind of like we're kind of making it some changes. But um, but yeah, we, that was not what we were trying to do. And, and I thought, well, you know, people need to get the stuff. It needs to come here from somewhere yeah. and they need to find it. If you're somebody who is interested in doing something like that. Also, I think that it's too much work for a farmer to have to produce it, distribute it. Ding, ding. I mean, it's, it's kind of almost near impossible. Anybody who's out there producing and going to a market only to have this market set up to not work for you. If you can even get into the market, yeah. which they don't want you to even come in, then you still got to operate under, uh, you know, health code. And if you're operating under health code, then you're having to adulterate your food that you work so hard to produce the right way. Yeah. And you can't even honor it at the end. Yeah. So it's ridiculous. And eaters don't know. Yeah. Eaters don't know. If yeah. they knew, that's, that's what I'm trying to teach them through my book. That's what I'm trying to teach them through the food church. And I had to call it a food church. I had to call it something, some kind of church. You know, because it's the only way that I was able to speak freely. Otherwise, everything I say is illegal. You know how Joel wrote that book called Everything I Want to Do is Illegal? Yeah. Well, everything I want to say, I can't even talk to you like an adult, one adult to another adult. We're not allowed to communicate. And so, you know, if you can't get past the fact that I called it a church, then just, you know, you got to put on your big boy, big girl panties and just like, <laughs> just understand that it's code. It's a code word for freedom, you know, freedom of speech. Like the only the only thing I could operate under was religious freedom at the end. I mean, yeah. yes, now actually, you know what, Mike, I say that. And at the same time, I have learned that I don't really need anything. I could just say, no, I yeah. am a free woman. <laughs> And I want to have a conversation with other free humans. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you're a free human out there and you want to have, I mean, I can kind of change the way I'm saying it now, but like, <laughs> you know, I think that it, like we all had to, you know, we're all learning together and we're all, we, you know, I, my parents were born slaves to the British India company for me to just even become an agorist and just to have this, ability to operate in my full power is, is a miracle. Okay. Because everything is wanting us to not, and everything's trying to keep everybody down even right now. Isn't that what we're trying to shake them out of? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. 
So as you've gone through all of this, it seems like your your life mission and purpose has kind of changed. Like your life has been like totally changed in so many ways. Is am I speaking incorrectly on that, or would you, you agree with that? I mean, Mike, I think since I saw you guys just two years ago on Polyface, my life is a whole different life already. Wow. wow. I, <laughs> I think a lot of us changed since 2020. <laughs> I agree. I totally agree. <laughs> I mean, I totally agree. that was, uh, that was now that I'm remembering it, it was November of 2020 when I saw you in person. That's that's exactly right. Yep. And it was after really? the WAPR conference got kicked out of, at ATL and and Joel opened the land up for Sally to bring the Weston A. Price event to his land for the first, very first get gathering. That was the only one of two conferences that I knew of that didn't get canceled that year. Well, and this was created as yeah. a side effect of a cancellation. It sure and was. Th it was Sally and Joel saying, "Uh, uh, we're taking it back." Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, sign me up for that. <laughs> and it was so it was so impactful that that one conference touched me in so many different ways. I, I knew before that we we need each other. We, we, we're not meant to be alone. So, so many times in the homesteaded community, we think that we're going to move out somewhere and we're never going to interact with people. And that's that's not healthy. And that's that's not that's not going to lead to long term happiness that we really do need people. We need a tribe of people around us and coming to that conference and you see people that hadn't gathered with other people all that year and, were, and, and they were coming there and they were tearing up and so happy to be there. It, it touched me in so many ways. It'll it'll be with me for the rest of my life. It was just really amazing. It definitely shaped us. And I think that it definitely I think that was the beginning. It really forged this power in all of us. Yeah. I, I mean, I definitely felt that from that. Yeah. It was tough, that, but it made me, made us stronger. I really do think that it's made us stronger, more resilient. Yeah. Um, our relationships have gotten stronger, I think. Yes. It definitely gave us all more deliberate intention to want to, I mean, we've definitely stayed in touch as a side effect of that event. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's been such a blessing in my life, I know for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Now, as you, as you, we are, we encourage others to, to live a healthier lifestyle. If you were to encourage people to, to do one thing or a couple things to, to live a healthier lifestyle, what would you say those things would be that you would say, I, I really want to see these people do this, this, or this. And I think that it would bring them better health. Well, I, I believe that mindset is the first thing. Um, I really want everyone out there to know that, you know, you have the ability to access infinite intelligence just by planting your feet in the soil and just quieting your mind and just, you know, um, appreciating um, our well-being that's everywhere outside. If you just go sit outside and just listen for the birds, listen for the water stream, listen for the wind you know, blowing through the grass or whatever it is. And if you just quietly focus on that for even just 17 seconds, then it will empower you to know your own power and know that you are able to discern what is real and what is not real and what is correct and what is not correct. So, you know, you don't need somebody else to tell you what is right and what is not right. And when you're listening to any of us speaking, then you should be able to know immediately who is speaking truth and who has this convoluted nonsense, you know? Um, and I, I mean, we're really just wanting everybody to walk back into their full power and know that you are a powerful, important, worthy being, you know, just because you were born worthy. Mm -hmm. And so that's number one. And then number two, I would say is that, you know, we all require supporting the full hoop of nature and you have to keep the hoop solid. And that requires you to focus. I mean, I focus a lot on livestock specifically because you can't have plants without animals. You can't have soil health without the animals and we, we can't heal without animals. 
yeah. without consuming animals. So don't ever let anybody talk you out of breaking this hoop. And it never makes sense to substitute chemistry projects for <laughs> what is actually real. Yeah. It, it's beyond my comprehension how people can, can fall for, um, you know, this beyond something or another. <laughs> and, and, and when you read the ingredients label, all it says is pea protein and you're willingly and deliberately and consciously giving them $12 for this pouch that's supposed to replace a pound of beef. <laughs> it's, it's beyond my understanding. Like, yeah. How are you willingly doing that for pea protein? Yeah. <laughs> and believing, because that's what it says on the ingredients, okay? Yeah. But, it, but that, that nobody looks at the ingredients. Everybody reads that box that is like, doesn't mean anything. Yeah. The one, you know, the dis, the shiny bright light, the distraction, yeah. <laughs> the distraction box that says something about protein and something fat and whatever, like it means nothing. Yeah. And, and, and also, um, I always go back to gravity, Mike. Like I love gravity. Gravity, gravity works indiscriminately for indiscriminately for every beast of the planet. Every every beast. It it loves us and it polishes us and it might kill you too, like equally. equally. Yeah. It's very fair and balanced, you know, because it it operates with boundaries. And if you don't respect and honor those boundaries, you're going to die. Yep. And yep. that's pretty much all of us, isn't it? Like we all have some boundaries yep. and you got to honor each other's boundaries. And if you are honoring each other's boundaries, then you can find something favorable with gravity as well. Yeah. It works really good for us most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> one, of the things, of the <laughs> one of the things that you uh, said that I really liked is is getting outside and, and, and getting that connection with the, the earth and and the, the things around us and, and getting into that quiet place. And that's one of the things that I really benefited from when we moved out to here to our homestead and, and having those moments. And you don't have to have a homestead to do it. You can just find places to do that at or go to other farms that you're visiting or buying from and, and make that connection. And it's so important especially if you connect it to that, that beyond substance. <laughs> Cause so much of, of what is out there, we get, people get caught up in the emotion of what is being said and they get easily influenced and just kind of go with the flow of the emotion instead of critically thinking and, and processing things uh, like we should be doing instead of just going with the flow. We need to, whatever it is in life, we just need to sit down, process our thoughts, process our feelings, process the things that we're being told and make better sound decisions on on matters and when you 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 read the ingredients list and you you think about things a little bit more or or, or think about cow farts causing climate change you're like that really does not make any sense at all <laughs> everything they say is so illogical i mean it is? I mean, okay, so I don't really listen to, you know, anything coming out of that lie box, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but recently I was just, I mean, at this red hot moment, I will tell you, I just think it's very comical it because is. <laughs> they just said, and I only figured, I only know about this because somebody told me, Mike, and, and, and then I had to look it up because I was like, really? And, and they just said on national television okay they said sometimes it might be okay to cannibalize yeah that's it's like this wow. is, okay but wait a second this is behind the plant-based agenda okay yeah. so first they tell you you should only be vegan to live and not die yeah but sometimes it might be okay to cannibalize it's it's like wow wow stop think, think, oh my think, gosh. Down, think through these things like this is ridiculous <laughs> i'm like wait a minute it's okay for you to okay they were okay here okay guys I just, I just don't understand this one thing like <laughs> they want me to feel horrible about taking the life of any of the livestock that we use to nourish our bodies okay but I'm not supposed to interfere with a crazy person 
who is marketing my child or any children for the act of violating the children. I'm not allowed to be upset about cannibalizing humans. I'm not supposed to want to protect and defend my own species on any level, but I'm supposed to think like and be like and, and empathize with and have compassion for the chickens and the hogs and the cows and the, and I'm just like, okay, this is not right. Also, oh, it's not, it's evil. <laughs> it's so crazy. And I'm just like, you know, one thing I know for sure is I have been on multiple farms. I have been in multiple situations where we have harvested livestock and the lie is that they, meaning the beasts of the planet, okay, believe and think and feel the way we do. But that is a, that's not true. No, We've been not. given dominion over all exactly the beasts right. of the planet. Exactly we have been right. given dominion, and that doesn't mean that we abuse any of that. That right. means that it is our work to yep. balance all of that. And they're only... Their only purpose in this lifetime is to provide nourishment for us yep. only after we provide the husbandry and honor their lives. Exactly right. All the days of our animals' lives here on the homestead, we try to provide them with everything they need as best we can. And as Joel said, just have, you have that one bad day. And that's 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 what we strive for. And, uh, and it's we, not we, bad to them, y'all. Let's just no. be very clear. <laughs> it's not bad to them. They don't know what's going on. And 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 I'm gonna tell you what. I how do they just come up into your arms? How do they just come to you? I have watched. I have watched like a whole line of steers walk up to the kill door, and they are very peaceful. Mm -hmm. They are not upset. You know what it is. They find joy in every moment, Mike. Yeah. They find joy and appreciation. They find yeah. unconditional joy and appreciation in this minute, in this yeah. minute, in this minute. And if in that minute they get knocked out, they don't know. Yeah. It's just yeah. nothing wrong with that. But like, let's go back to Native Americans. What about them? Like when everything, when we were operating with herds that were miles long and miles wide, I mean, what was going on with the global warming then? I don't know. That's, that's one of my arguments. Miles <laughs> wide. And, and, you know, when we would, heart, when, when the Native Americans, let me tell you what, the Native Americans only ate buffalo. Wait, let me just say it again. They only <laughs> ate buffalo. They weren't eating vegetables and they weren't eating all this other stuff. I mean, I'm not saying that they didn't sometimes eat something on the way to, you know, whatever, while they were on a hunt or whatever. But they were not starving. They weren't going without food for any 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 amount of time. Yeah. And when they would make a harvest, they had the energy and the strength to take, not only take, first of all, they were taking the oldest herbivores. Why? Because if you put beef out on the land and you raise them out to 15 years old, Oh, that's some beautifully marbled beef. But like when you're farming it, it isn't efficient financially. But when you have miles wide and miles long herds and you're taking the old, old ones out, you don't want to take no young bucks out. Yeah. You take the old fatty ones out that can't keep up or whatever. Yeah. They're totally happy. It's not like they haven't had a good life. Yeah. As evidenced by the beautiful marbling and that medicine, that beautifully marbled medicine is what is, you know, nourishing. And it kept everybody, those guys, there weren't no fat, obese, diabetic, cancerous Native American. Yeah. <laughs> they were strong. They were able to go out there, harvest this beast and carry it back to wherever their camp was. Yeah. How, how did they do that? They didn't have bulldozers and they didn't have, you know, front end 
machinery. <laughs> You're right. You're exactly right. And uh, one of the things that I really admired about Weston A. Price and uh, learned from him is when he did it, he went out all over the place trying to find a, a, a culture that thrived on a vegan diet. And, and he was unsuccessful in doing so. And, and he actually converted him the other way <laughs> that he was pro, pro meat after that. And, and after just our time here homesteading and even the time farming, like, it's, like you were talking about the difference before, is like one of the things that I realized is like there's a lot of energy expended in growing vegetables. Even when I was growing a lot of lettuce and then I was got I got to thinking about it, all that energy thinking years ago, they would not have put all that energy into growing lettuce because it's not nutrient dense at all. That no. would not, it's not going to keep you alive. <laughs> no. And people, people think that, you know, what I find um, hilarious. I was, I just had a conversation with Dr. Anthony Chafee and he is so funny. He's like, cause we were talking about the economics of this and I, you know, people are so busy trying to defend beef and, you know, prices and whatever. Let me just tell y'all something. Millions of Americans. I have this new series on my newsletter, Mike. It's called math, not magic. OK, <laughs> what I've been talking about is, did you know that millions of Americans believe that uh, fast food burgers are cheap and affordable? I mean, millions of them believe this. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you know that you're paying thirty five dollars a pound for that? Oh, wow. I like that. That's interesting. Wow. I mean, if you what people don't understand is when you cook meat. Now you might know this, Mike. If you take a pound of meat and you cook it after the shrinkage, it is only twelve ounces of meat. It's not sixteen ounces anymore. Mm -hmm. There's a loss when you cook it. Anyone out there who has taken a hog, for example, or a or a beef or anything, and you go to take it and get it processed. If they were to smoke it for you and give it back to you, there's a loss of about 20%. Okay. And so if it was 15 pounds, you're paying for 15 pounds to be smoked or whatever, but you get back 20% less. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wait a minute, I where's the rest of my 15 pounds? You know? And so, but when you go to the whatever fast food place and you get your quarter pound burger, did you weigh that quarter pound to me? Because it is not a quarter pound. <laughs> it is not a quarter pound. It is, it is, it is about 0. 0.2 ounces. Okay. Yeah. And um, it is not, it is not what you, it should be four ounces. Why isn't it four ounces? Because 16 ounces is a pound, right? So four would be a quarter, but it's only 0. 0.2. Why? <laughs> oh, because, you know, 25 is a quarter. No, mm -hmm. no. This is bad math, people. Bad math. Okay. That's a good one. I like that one. And you're, you'll you'll joyfully, happily pay, you know, seven to ten dollars for a burger at yeah. a fast food joint. Yeah. You know, oh well, it comes with fries and a drink. Well, that drink costs nothing. And that those, you know, how much are potatoes? I don't know. Are they real potatoes? I don't even know. But like exactly right. whatever, whatever that other side stuff is, is you know, decoration. Yeah. And, but That's okay. bun. <laughs> so, so now you've effectively paid, if you paid 10, you paid $40 a pound. Okay. And so think about that y'all like, and so anything that, that means that our one pound at $15 a pound retail, which is what it should be. Yeah. If you're not allowed to retail it, you have to go to a farmer's market and only sell it for wholesale which makes it $7. And that's not even grocery store kind of retail, you guys. And what I mean is, or I mean wholesale, like grocery store wholesale. Do you know that you've never paid for your food at a grocery store, Mike? Hmm. You've only paid for distribution. Mm. This is called modern day slavery. So, the person that produced that CAFO meat mm -hmm. is being held hostage by the three packers that you can get meat from. Yeah, I have heard that. Yeah. Yep. And how, how, does that, how does that work? And all that. <laughs> it's math, not magic, people. How do yeah. you know? How how is that working? It this is how it works, y'all. This is what people need to know. Is 
those guys have a million dollar investment in their CAFO chicken houses. Okay. And they get paid pennies on the dollar yep. for these birds. Those birds, they basically pay 25 cents a bird. Okay. How is that paying for, I mean, I don't care how much volume it is because it's 10,000 birds in a house. 50% of them are dead. And so now whatever, what do the math. Okay. Do all the math. So those guys are in infinite debt, infinite debt. Yep. They can never get out of the debt. Yep. And the banks just keep restructuring their loans and letting them keep moving because in America, the banks are in on this craziness. Okay. Yep. And they, where are the banks making their money from your medical debt? Mm. It's a big, they have made their own hoop of madness. And if you really follow the money, then what you'll realize is your $3 a pound meat at the grocery store. You didn't even pay for that is not paying for the meat because if you understand how much it costs to go to market, do you know grocery stores make their, how they make their money? No, not exactly. Grocery stores make their money because Mike, the fit farmer wants to bring his stuff in to the grocery store. Okay. If Mike wants to bring his stuff into the grocery store, Mike has to pay for the shelf space. And then you get to pick how much you're going to pay for the shelf space. And then whatever they don't sell, Mike, you got to take it back, which means what your produce that you might take there, you got to now take it back because it went bad, whatever. They're not, they're not taking the risk on it. You are, and they're going to call you to come take it back. Can you imagine you took all that stuff there? You're hoping to get a paycheck and they're calling you to come back. How you feel about that? Wow. Wow. You're like, oh my goodness. No, no, no. So you're paying them to get in. Wow. And then you're paying them for what? When do you get paid? Wow. When do you get paid? It's like you're in bondage all around. Right. And so, you know, and all those grocery stores don't want to work with Mike the Fit Farmer because yeah. you're a, a pain in the butt. It's easier for us to work with this this distribution company that yeah. will handle all of the Mike fit farmers because this human relationship is a little bit too complicated. Yeah. And you know, Mike isn't going to just come at 7am every single week, all the time, yeah. whatever, where some truck is going to show up at exactly the same time, all the time, no matter what, because Mike actually has goats or yeah. something else that could be <laughs> more crazy that he has to handle. And so Mike exactly. might get caught up and he won't show up at the same time or whatever. These are the things that we have to deal with here at the food church. We got to deal with Mike having to deal with the goat that got out, that tore up something that he had to fix before he could get in the car. And then as he got down the road, he got a flat tire and who knows what happened. Just like, <laughs> yeah. Just I lie. mean, does that sound about uh, right? That sure, like, does. <laughs> that sure does. That totally does. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So you see how the bondage works, guys. And then we think that, well, it's just easier to go to the grocery store. It's so hard to have a relationship with this Mike, the fit farmer guy. And like, why do I want to buy food from Mike? Cause yeah, that's real. It sounds real good, but ugh, he's going to be late again yeah. or something's going to have happened. And I'm going to have to offer him grace every single time I get up with him. But you know, that food sure it does taste good. Yeah. It's also really expensive. So maybe it's just better for me to just go to the grocery store. And I think as a, as a society as a whole, we don't understand how we're deaf by convenience in so many different ways. Or, or well, Mike, how do you afford to feed yourself? <laughs> I mean, just after all of this, how do you, how do you afford it? Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Do you think that, it, do you think that you're able to, once you were able to let the corporatocracy go, do you believe that you are able to bask in the abundance that nature has just provided for you and is offering to everyone? It, just, just from being able to see uh, and have so many tastes of it here on what we're able to do, as well as visiting other homesteads that are, are able to produce abundance, we could have so much more abundance if we did things differently in, in our country and in the world. 
we really could. It's capable of producing so much. <laughs> Our life. We're, we're so abundant here. We're, yeah. so, we're so abundant here. How do I afford it? I'm not producing my own food. How do I afford it? What about the people that come here and they're not producing their own food? They pay the real price to the real yeah. farm. Yeah. And they're also paying a fee to be a member here because that is what taking responsibility looks like. It is. And guess what? They're, they were able to get rid of the doctor. Mm -hmm. They were able to fire the, their pharmacist with a PHA, you know, yeah. they, they were able to turn their health all the way around. They were, they're able to afford this lifestyle even as a college student or a single mom, or, you know, there's nobody who can't enjoy and walk in their full power, even paying somebody what is actually the true price of it. And we still save more money. Did you exactly know that? Right. Exactly right. And I think a lot of it boils down to what we value. Like how do people afford these things? They're pretty expensive. <laughs> But people find a way to make it happen because <laughs> they, they see a value in it. When you see the value in, in uh, the food grown a better way and keeping you out of the, the hospital, keeping you out of having health, other health problems, keeping you in better health so that way you can be more productive, uh, you, you have a greater value on that food. And it, that the price, you begin to look at it differently. It's an investment in yourself and in your family and, and the health of yourself and your family. I think you're talking about priorities. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I mean, look, I tell people even a crack addict can afford to buy crack. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? That might not sound very good, but what I mean is that they aren't working. How do they come up with this money? Yeah. You know, I don't know what they're doing, but yeah. I, I know what I, what I know for sure is that you can afford anything that you want if it is a priority in your life you sure yeah exactly right exactly and right. so so when someone says to me i can't afford something or another you know what i say nothing but the truth i say well i can't you know i can't help you create value for your worth because i believe you were born worthy mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if you don't believe it it doesn't matter what I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope that you just can love yourself more. Yeah. Yeah. I think that combined with the, what we've been sold over the decades of, of cheap food. We think um, that all we've food been, is that. We've been diminished, Mike. What's what, what I, I created this board here and, um, and it says, you know, on the left, it says fragility. And on the right, it says robust. And it's, I said that we're the remnants rising. And what we need to do is shed our slave selves and walk towards a more powerful life. And, he, and in the middle, we need to allow the purification that is always happening for us. Yeah. Through the infinite intelligence. And so what I mean is that this fragile person is 100% plant-based plant and this robust person is 100% meat-based. I mean, just using Native Americans as an example, okay? And in the middle is uh, what we call contentment. And that's like 50-50 balanced meat and vegetables. And that honestly is the middle of the road. If mm -hmm. the whole highway is from fragility to robustness, this contentment piece is in the middle, okay? And, you know, Everybody on the left, on the first half of this journey, is operating in drugs, in, you know, um, anxiety, depression, grief, um, you know, chaos, confusion, yeah. and, and dependency. And what we want is for them to gain some independence and invite them to get past this contentment towards a more robust life where there's joy and there's uh, love. And there you can't unconditionally love anyone if you aren't happy and joyful first. Yeah, you're right. 
so you have to be able to nourish yourself and find that love of, for yourself. Yeah. If I don't love myself, I can't love you. It, it's really love, hard. Yeah. If yeah. I don't love myself, you can't love me. No, because when you're in, you're in that negative mindset, that negative shell, it's all inward. You're not able to look outward to, to give. Right. If you're doing everything for the money, yeah. then you are going to not ever get past contentment. Yeah. If you're doing everything for the love of, of everyone, then you're going to be able to do anything that you need to do, which is what we did. Yeah. I mean, I was on food stamps and with a child in the hospital and all this chaos and confusion and depression and anxiety and Blech. It was bleh and bleh and bleh. It was not good. Yeah. Yeah. How was I able to lose a child and find my way all the way to, to, you know, um, loving people unconditionally. Like I could just see them where they're at. I, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just like, I'm so sad that you can't love yourself. Please start loving yourself. Yeah. Yeah. We went through a, a similar thing and, uh, and, and, and a number of different capacities and, and I got to the point where I was looking back at myself and I was like, you know what? I feel like I have allowed this situation, these situations that we've gone through to mm -hmm. turn me into a person I don't want to be. Yes. So I'm like, yeah. all right, I'm going to be, start being the person that I want to be. And then you start changing and then you're looking outward and yeah. life's different. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's a little bit hard to get the momentum going. Yes. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you fall back into that a little bit you get a yep. little bit off the trail like i tell everybody i'm like you're gonna get lost a little bit it's okay like mm -hmm. just find your way back onto the path you know just yeah. find it like we'll just be over here going come on come this way and you know like how you do what do you do when kids fall down and they're trying to walk you don't say get up you little dummy you don't say that you just say come on come on you know you don't want to spank them you just be like yeah. oh it's okay you know like let's go let's go try again and you yeah. just say come this way come this way and you just try yeah. to bring them but like yeah i mean sometimes people think what we're saying is too mean because i just won't have this i will not allow people to argue for their limitations in front of me yeah you know when they stand before me and they're just like you know well i can't afford that well sorry yeah I, I don't know why you can't afford it, but I believe you can afford whatever you want. I mean, we're noticed, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're probably dealt with this. And I have it, it when I was a personal trainer, even when I try to help people in their situations and, and consoling them. Now, some people have to make a decision to come out of their own misery and their own uh, situation that they're in. Some people find so many excuses around why they can't change instead of making a change. Yeah. So I'm sure you deal with that a lot. Yeah. And it, and all, it's interesting because I'll see people and then, ooh, sorry, I just shook my whole <laughs> desk. <Earthquake>. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I just, I find that there are those people, I, I, I seem to have these negative ninnies that come around every once in a while. And then, but they don't go away. Like yeah. they come back sometime and, you know, they even get mad at me. They even sometimes yell at me oh, and they're wow. just like, you know, this is ridiculous. This is, you know, you, this is rigged. This is, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And yeah. I'm just like, you know, yeah. um, you know how you got those boundaries. You got those reasons you have to operate this way or you're going to fall off the cliff. Okay. Yeah. You have to do it this way or you're going to fall off the cliff. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and they just are like, and I said, well, we don't enslave our farmers. Yeah. <laughs> we don't, we don't do that. And in the same way, you know, we don't want to punish the eater either. Right. Yeah. Like we don't want the eater also to uh, have to always have things that they don't want. I think the biggest thing that people have to change their mind about is the fashion, the style in which they receive the things or whatever. Yep. You gotta, you gotta make a little bit, it's a little bit weird. J Joel said, Neethi, you created all these weirdnesses, but now he's like, oh, she's rogue food and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, um, it is a weirdness. It is something that's weird because it is outside of anything outside of the orthodoxy is weird. Yep. 
I mean, he's the lunatic farmer, so, you know, he's weird too. But <laughs> I told him, I said, well, you got these weird styles of farming, supposedly. Yeah. So I am doing the same thing because people want me, they want to treat me like I'm a grocer. But if I was actually a grocer, I'd be making money left, right, and center. And it's just, a, it's a real estate business at that point. It's not. Yeah. You know, yeah. but that is not what, that's the reason why the centralized food system is not the way y'all. Yeah. That's the reason why we got to go back to the natural law. Yeah. And so what's happening outside right now is that we are being pushed back into natural law or we're going to die. Yep. Yep. And so, I mean, meaning like you're going to fall off the cliff y'all. This is like, we're yeah. the boundaries of gravity, right? Yeah. So how do we um, make it more palatable or make it more whatever? Like everybody doesn't have to go homestead. And also all homesteaders aren't really, you know, don't know how to do anything right away. Yeah, that's right. You, you don't just move out onto the homestead. And I mean, I've been watching you guys, you know, progressively. Do You didn't have goats? No, no. I don't remember you even having chickens at the beginning. Uh, we didn't have meat chickens at all. And we just, you just take it a little here, there. And even when you, when you have been doing it a number of years, you're still not doing it all. You still need other farms to get from and work with it, it, back to that community thing. We, it, we have to be, we have to be connected. We have to work with one another. Right. I mean, it's not going to, if everybody goes and starts homesteading, it is not going to put farms out of business. It is not. No. I mean, just for beef alone. Yep. You know, just for beef alone, it's not going to put them out of business. And every, but we need everybody. We, we need, do. we yeah. need everybody, even if they're falling, failing forward all yeah. day long, yeah. trying to homestead. This is not to discourage homesteading. It is not. Yeah. It is to saying, you know, don't. I, I like what Joel said to us. We we had a meeting with him about us buying land and you know whatever. I was like, we're old. <laughs> but you know we want to we really want the freedom of, of the land and we want to be able to you know develop our children and and, and move the food church out there and we want to create this demonstration space and we want to have festivals and we really want you guys to come out and see us and stuff and great. so yeah we want to be teaching there and all this kind of thing and so we're working on that and and the first thing joel said was don't do it unless it's for your heart Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, because when you go through the tough times, if it's not there in your heart, it ain't gonna make it. <laughs> mm -mm. So the last year, that's what we did. I, my husband and I just invested the last year in each other. Yeah, that and makes just sense. you know practicing. What if we did it this way? What do you think? What do you think? You know, how do we feel? Is that going to be good? Is that going to be, uh, you know, and it took time to be like, okay, I think we can find something for all of us to do and be joyful if we're going to move out onto the land. And it's not going to maybe look like what everybody thinks that it's going to look like. Yeah. 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 I applaud you for that. That's, that's neat because uh, the people are at the center of it. It's not. It's, it's about the people. Yeah, it has to be. So that's the other thing. They don't want anything to be about the people. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> it's only supposed to be about the money. Yeah. Or yep. the furries or what in the world? Yeah. Yeah. Or the crisis. It's the latest crisis, isn't it? It is. It is. And we could go on and on about some more of those things. <laughs> but one of the things I do want to ask you is uh, you've been working with people for a number of years and helping them to change their health. You have, you don't have to say names, but do you have any testimonials or, of things that maybe you've taken somebody from a vegan diet and helped them with issues or that you'd be willing to share? Well, I published in my book, everybody who was willing to share their story at that time. So if you look at the back of the book, the last third, sorry, I'm going to plug my computer in or else it's going to die. Oops. Uh, I, just I just saw the red light. I'm sorry. Um, if you look at the last third of the book, it is all um, testimony um, from people who are willing to share their stories. And, you know, I get a lot of folks that say to me, you know, if I had that experience, I would do whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, you don't know what you would do. Mm -hmm. And also you don't know if you want everybody in the world to know 
your personal business like that. So yeah. I don't know that that's really true, but I will say that the one, one of the people that I was hoping was going to share her story didn't share her story. Okay. Um, it was very emotional for her, but when I met her, she was in a wheelchair with MS. Oh, wow. And you wouldn't know who she was anymore because she does not have a wheelchair. She has 100% recovered. She 100% um, her lesions and everything are gone. This was years ago when she joined. Wow. And I will also say that people who have joined, most of the people that I've coached have been here local and they've been a part of the food church. I, I started doing this online coaching thing, which was really difficult. I found, I found it very hard because I, I mean, I know that, I mean, I'm, I'm actually putting together this online thing, which I still am building. Um, but I took the last year off of that and I was just working with the few people that I started coaching because I didn't want to leave anybody in the lurch. But I started, I am building this thing, but I wanted to take the time to like, my husband and I were just like, we need to, what are we doing? Like after 2020, it was kind of, you know, obviously we had to figure something better out. Yeah. So we, we, I did have to take time for myself, but I am launching this platform um, where people will be able to do a DIY coaching thing because honestly folks you have to make these changes yourself and i want you to be able to start there and then we're gonna i'm gonna start next year doing groups um where you know people can ask questions and it would be a lot more affordable and you'd have some support and um it wouldn't be because over here in person i do much more serious conditions so when people want me to work with them for cancer or for something more serious, then they're, it's better to do that in person. I think, um, I'm not comfortable doing it long distance, but I know people who I can connect you with who can do that, you know, if you want, but yes, we have been reversing everything from seizures to, and cancers and MS for sure. A lot of mental health, a lot of, uh, spectrum, and helping people reverse like vaccine injuries and things like that. Um, definitely we can reverse all of Crohn's, IBS, like name your digestive problem, name your kidney and renal failure problem. I mean, that's the major stuff. I mean, okay. you know, definitely, you know, it improves your heart health, your, I mean, diabetes, thyroid, all that stuff is easy, easy stuff to, to change because it is 100% a lifestyle. Yeah. Problem. Yeah. So, I mean, as evidenced by just historically looking, you know, ancestrally. Yeah. <laughs> the, the fact that none of this stuff existed. Yeah. Even, even uh, 50 years ago, it wasn't that prevalent. Yeah. So. So you have uh, you have a course or thing that you're creating to help people if they want to become food aggregators. You also are working on this DIY nutrition thing. Yes. Uh, what else do you have going on that people can check out and learn about you? Well, I'm hoping that we can invite people to our land. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because we want to be able to do a lot of like permaculture demonstrations and workshops. And I mean, we're not that I'm going to be teaching them, but you know, maybe I could get Mike, the fit farmer out there. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I would love to see you come out there. I would love for Lacey maybe to come and do a class for how she makes amazing stuff. Cause she yeah. has a, like amazing stuff that she makes. Yeah, and, I'm sure um, do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, we got folks like Billy Bond. We have folks like, you know, um, Joel or Daniel or anybody, I don't know if, you know, who, anybody who we can get to come out and help teach some things we would be, there's lots of incredible folks, including our own food church people like, you know, grass grazed. So. Yeah. And speaking of that, we want to come to your place in the next uh, month or so, if that's okay to see your operation with the food church and how you do everything. So we'll have to schedule that. Uh, and also, if you could send me some of those links, we're going to include that in uh, an email so people can check out those different things for you and, and get involved in that and your email newsletter if you still have that going. We'll connect yeah. people with that, too. That'd be great. 
Yeah, and I'm going to get better with my email newsletter because that was, you know, I, like I said, I took a year off to kind of just go inward to yeah. just, we, I mean, you know, sorry, but without my husband, nothing's happening. So, <laughs> we need each other. There we go. We need each other. And we just needed to, you know, because I had been doing this for 12 years um, one way and then this 2020 chaos hit and I was like, uh oh. Yeah. I think all of us had to do like a rut row. What are we? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I haven't met your husband yet, so I want to look forward to meeting him, too, when we come out there. Oh, you definitely, yeah. Oh, God, I guess he didn't come to, uh, you know, the, the last few times that we went to Polyface, he was with me. And, um, I, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. I, you guys just, I can't wait for you. Hey, well, you know, in October, we're going to have the first food church conference here. When in October? Because we'll be, got a lot going on in October, but I'd like to come if we could. Yeah, so it's October 15th weekend. We're all, we'll be in South Dakota then. <laughs> oh, wow. And then we're coming um, back after that to the Wise Traditions con, uh, Conference. Are you going to that? That's the, that one, I think this time is in Tennessee, right? Yes. Yes. I think it's literally on the heels of mine. Okay. And okay. because actually, um, Solari and, um, you know, Pete Kennedy and all them are going to be here. Okay. The New Church Conference. And then they're going directly there. I think okay. it's like, three it might be so i don't know yeah if i'll if i'll be there or not but okay. um i and mean next weekend we have uh the thing uh the nose to tail at polyface are you coming to that next week yeah oh i actually told lacy that i wanted to come there and i haven't i wasn't planning to come there for that but okay. um i'll see i'll see what i can do because yeah. i i actually am well you know poly faces our backup farm guys for the food church here and so we are getting regular items through here and i have an order but from what i understand it wasn't ready okay so i'm waiting on it and that was probably why i wasn't coming but <laughs> uh, uh, well, for those of you listening in you can come to the no stale conference at poly face farm uh next this coming weekend i actually will be speaking this coming friday What's that one going to be about? Tickets are still be available. What was that? What's that one about? It is um, Maureen Diaz. Uh, she started her organization, God's Good Table. Yeah. And I will be speaking there. I think Daniel's speaking, Pork Ryan and some others. Uh, and Sally Fallon from uh, Weston A. Price will be speaking uh, at that event. And uh, it's, it's kind of along the lines of uh, biblical nutrition and biblical farming. So we'll be, we'll be talking on that. So looking forward well, to it. I, okay, well, you know, I just want to come see you guys. Like, come on, <laughs> I just want to come see y'all. Come um, on, if I if there's a way for me to come, I will come just just for my own fun vacation for me. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, think, I think everybody should come, but I'll tell everybody in my food church too, yeah. because everybody who's around here, I know a lot. I know several people who need to come and listen to you guys from that perspective, and I love Maureen. Yeah, she's she's great. She's great. Yeah. Lacey, do we have uh, anybody have any more questions for Anithi? No. Well, Anithi, is there anything, uh, the only last thing that you want to cover uh, before we uh, wrap it up, call it a day? I don't know. I, I hope that I'll get to meet a lot of people here, um, you know, in October. And, you know, the Food Church Conference is, you know, we're calling all health coaches. We're calling all um, folks who want to maybe learn how to run their business uh, under natural law. Like, you know, I know a lot of folks are trying to figure out a way to uh, break out of the corporatocracy. And so if you're somebody who's out there, if you're a homesteader who wants to try to learn how to run their operation in such a way that they can make it profitable and, you know, uh, see how we do it under natural law, then it'll be a good time to come. We also, if you are an aspiring uh, regenerative farmer, then, you know, Derek's going to be doing a regenerative, how to start a farm 101 uh, workshop on Thursday. I'm doing a food church workshop on Friday. And then on Saturday, we're going to have all the speakers with, uh, so Daniel speaking, uh, Dr. Kim Berry will be here speaking. Wow. Um, and, uh, uh, Paige and Derek are going to be speaking. We got Nicole Sauce from Living Free in Tennessee. She's going to be talking about underground networks. Wow. And how important that is. Um, and so, you know, basically anything and everything that we've had to incorporate to create the food church, um, those, there, oh, because Daniel's going to be talking about how big farms grow small farms. And Derek and Paige will be, 
you know, letting you guys know how they're working with Polyface because they're a small farm growing. Wow. And, you know, I think it would be really interesting for even especially any homesteaders that are thinking about taking that bigger step into going into farming um, or just you want to get started. It'll be a good time for you guys to come out and check that out. That's fantastic. And we'll provide that those links for that uh, on my email newsletter, as well as on Abundance Plus uh, member section. Uh, so, Neethi, thank you very much for spending time with us. It was a joy. I uh, always enjoy chatting with you. And uh, thank you for your time on this Sunday chatting with me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. And, you know, anything you guys need. I love you all so much. And big hugs. Yeah. and congratulations on the new baby coming thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> love it all the good news all the new babies more babies to yeah. live that's exciting and yeah, it is exciting <laughs> <laughs> well take care we love you and everybody hope you have an enjoyable rest of your sunday and week coming up see you guys <laughs>